Emily, good to see everyone this morning. Uh, Proverbs 4 is where I'm going to be. I wanted to share something that I feel the Lord's taught me as I've been raising children, mostly through my failures, actually. Um, but he's taught me not only about parenting, but he's also taught me about um, himself and what it means to be a child of God and how he teaches us. As we teach our children, oftentimes, I feel the Lord eliminates things. You go, oh, wow, that's how he's trying to teach me, too. So I wanted to share, and just by way of um, illustration, I'll, I'll share one particular failure. I noticed a few months back, there was a little bit of a squabble, let's say, that was happening, and a little bit of roughness happening, and I and somebody got hurt, and somebody else wasn't really um, interested in remedying the situation. And I came to that person, I said, what do we say? And she looked at me, and she was like, uh, yes, sir. I go, no, what do we say? Excuse me? No, what do we say? Uh, you're welcome. And I realized I'm trying to teach her too many things. And it's on me. Um, when I come to a child and say, what do you say? And unless, it's, unless it's pretty clear that I have one lesson in mind, I'm setting them up for failure. And... Um, I've noticed that uh, I can't teach my children too many things at once. I actually have to focus. And if you talk to parents, I think Josh mentioned this when he shared. If you talk to experienced parents and you say, hey, what are, you wor- what are your children working on right now? You, they generally have one or two things in their mind. They say, this is what we're working on right now. It doesn't mean that's all there is. As, as parents, we can see there's actually tons of things we need to work on. But we say, hey, the most important thing, we have a sense of priority. In my mind as a father, I know I'm really right now I'm wanting to drive home this message. And over time, I've, I hope I'm better. We could, we could have a pop quiz and see how I'm doing. But I think actually I'm focused enough now on my parenting attempts that it's a little bit more obvious to my kids. I stopped trying to train them in everything at once and say, what's the one or two things I'm focusing on right now? And um, I, I find also that as a parent, and this to me is showing me something about God, I also arrange circumstances as chances for my children to practice the thing that I'm focused on. So if I'm focused, for example, on being gentle, all of a sudden as a parent, I see all sorts of opportunities where maybe even the children don't, maybe even it's not apparent that they aren't being gentle, but I see training opportunities there because of my training agenda as a parent. And um, the same is true in sports too, or music or anything else. I mean, uh, I think anybody who's advanced could see endless opportunities for me to improve in basketball. I'd see Daniel, for example. He's an amazing basketball player. I'm no, I'm no good. If you ask Daniel, hey, what should Jeremy work on? He, first of all, he'd probably say, uh, where do I start? Because <laughs> there's a lot of things. But I bet if he thought about it, he'd say, you know, there's kind of one thing that if you really focus on this, that would take his game to the next level. Or um, in music, for example, I'm not a, I, I can hardly play the piano at all. I was noticing the other night, um, a, bun- uh, a few of us were hanging out, and... Um, I, I asked a question about the piano, and there were a bunch of ideas that kind of got thrown out there, and then one kind of master pianist said, just do this. And he just, there's no more conversation. It's not about a thousand things, because in reality, I have about a thousand things I could do better on the piano. But this guy had the wisdom to say, just do this one thing. And somebody asked a question, he said, that, that comes later. <laughs> he just needs to know how to do this right now. Where this is like kindergarten, right? And the point is, parents have this idea of, where are we focusing right now? I think in sports, they have this idea, what are we focusing on right now? What are the drills that need to be run right now? In, sport, in music, in lots of things. Um, and I feel this has taught me something about my relationship with my father as well. That he is a good parent. He's the very best coach. He's the very best instructor. And um, he certainly sees a lot of things, undoubtedly, that I have to work on. But he's usually, what I found is he's usually focused on one or two lessons at a time. There's a couple of things that he's really focused on, and that's where he wants me to grow in. And, you know, I mentioned last week that I, I, was, I had a situation that tempted me to worry, and I felt the Lord was really uh, wanting to deal with me in that. And um, I find that he's allowed, actually, not just that one situation, but many circumstances that have kind of shaken my sense of confidence or my sense of uh, trust in him to show me where I'm prone to worry and where I'm prone to set my mind on the things of this world, etc. And so just like a good father, he's arranged circumstances to really reinforce this lesson that he's trying to teach me. 
And that's, that's all well and good, but the problem I found is the same challenge that I faced as an inexperienced parent of um, trying to convey too many lessons at once, I can accidentally expect that of the Lord too. I want too many lessons. What I found is as a child of God, I don't want him just to focus on one thing with me. I want a lot of material. And um, that's a problem because what's kind of behind that is I assume I've graduated from the, oh yeah, the worry lesson, that was next, next uh, last week. On to the next thing. And it's like, I was thinking about it, it's like, um, you know, if Daniel gave me a dribbling drill or something and I did it right once, I'm like, okay, what's next? He's like, no, no, I want you to do that like, a hundred times a day for the next three weeks, right? Or if I if I do my D scale right one time and then I go to the piano instructor, so teach me E. It's like, no, no, you gotta do that a bunch of times. You, I want that to become muscle memory before we work on the next thing. And um, what the Lord's been convicting me of is don't move on from my training program so quickly. There are things I wanna teach you and I wanna establish you in some truths. I don't want you just to rush on ahead. You know, we live in this kind of always available, Twitter-obsessed culture where we're, we always want news, right? There's 24-7 news. What is news? It's new. News, right? It's new information. And we want to process it all the time. We live in this world where there's <clears throat> always new stimuli. And I feel one of the things that the Lord's been warning me about is don't let this uh, Twitter-obsessed obsession with novelty creep into your relationship with me, Jeremy. I don't want you to focus on always getting new things. I want you to be established in some old things first. And uh, there's a verse, so if you turn to Proverbs 4, there's a phrase that comes up repeatedly in the Proverbs in various ways, but it's essentially this. It, it can be encapsulated in Proverbs 4 if you look at verse 20. He says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Don't let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart for their life to those who find them, and health to all their body. And it's interesting to me, as I read this, that word let, do not let them depart from your sight, really stood out to me. It says keep them in the midst of your heart. And what that implied to me is that the instruction in the path of righteousness, for whatever reason, it's prone to leave me. When it says don't let it leave, don't let it depart, what is it saying? What he's warning us is the natural state of our minds and our natural um, you know, man, is to let truth leave. And he's, it's repeated in Proverbs 3 and Proverbs 6 and Proverbs 7, but this idea of don't let it leave. Grab a hold of it. Hold on to it. And that's, it's as if Solomon was saying, if you're going to exert energy, don't focus on learning something new. Exert energy to hold on to what you've already received. And for me, this has been a challenging verse for me because I feel when I exert energy, I'm always exerting energy after something new. And what the Lord's been saying to me is, no, 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 don't let what you've already received depart. Keep, that's an active verb, keep it in the midst of your heart. And I think um, more broadly speaking, I, you know, as I've been, we've been at church now for six and a half years. We've been meeting together for over eight years. I find we keep reemphasizing the same truths again and again and again, right? And I think this is why we do. We keep emphasizing things like the goodness and the love of our Father, the wickedness of sin, building the body, seeking unity, loving one another, listening to the Lord, depending on the Holy Spirit. Um, we keep reading these messages because of this very reason, that the truth is prone to leave our minds. There's an old saint uh, who once said, we are leaky vessels, I think that's true. I see that with myself. I'm a leaky vessel, and I have to be reminded. I need, you know, Paul. both Peter and Paul said at different points in their letters, it's of no trouble to me to remind you of these same things because it's a safeguard to you. It's a good help to you. And I've seen in me, I don't, want, I don't want old things. I want new things. And the Lord says, no, don't let these old things depart from your mind. And, you know, the Lord's been teaching me we shouldn't be thinking about instruction in the way of godliness as computer programming. You know, I, I, don't, I know nothing about it, so I'll start by saying that. But what I do understand, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, is you don't have to program it multiple times. It's like you just write it in, and it's done, and you can move on to the next line of code or whatever. But um, for us as human beings, as preachers with a flesh, what gets encoded, truth that get, gets encoded doesn't get encoded forever. There are certain key themes we see echoed over and over and over and over in the scriptures 
And the reason the Lord was willing to repeat himself, we have four Gospels, for example. We have many letters that are very closely related to each other. Why did the Lord in his infinite wisdom, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, repeat himself so much? Because we are prone to forgetting, we're prone to letting these things go. And he wanted to establish his people in these truths. And so um, that's how we see the truth here. It's not just that every week is a chance to proclaim some new thing, but rather it's a chance to remind ourselves of the ancient paths, so to speak. It's what one of the prophets says. Lead me in the ancient paths. And um, God is the same yesterday, it says, today and forever. The problem is we keep changing. And we are prone to forgetting. That's why the proverb says, don't let these words depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart. But I was thinking, the Lord is so good to us. I don't know about you. What I, my honest testimony is, these old truths are always fresh to me. Even though every variant of what everyone shares, basically every week, it comes back down to these foundational principles. It's always fresh. And it's actually helped me understand, you know, in Revelation it says they sang a new song to the Lord. But when you read the song, it doesn't, there's nothing new there. But it's because it's always fresh for people for whom this is true. And I found that in our church that I don't mind being reminded. I appreciate it. I need it. And it's always new, just like that song in Revelation is always new. These truths become always new. The same old truth about entering the promised land, about killing every giant, about preserving our pure and simple devotion to Jesus Christ, about hating sin and loving righteousness. They're always new to me. It says, if you look at this next verse in Proverbs 4, it says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for, flow it, for from it flow the springs of life. And for, for me, what this says is recognize these precious truths, these precious few truths are always under attack. They're always being threatened, and they're always trending towards departing from our hearts. And I have to watch my heart. And I, the, what the Lord was showing to me there in that verse is, a lot of times, I think when I think about guarding my heart, I think about protecting it from bad stuff coming in. That's what it means to guard my heart, right? But here in the context here, what Solomon's saying is watching your heart actually means keep the good stuff from going out. So we should definitely protect our hearts from the bad stuff coming in. But the question that's been coming to my heart is, am I just as diligent to keep the good stuff in and to keep it from leaking out? And that's, it says, guard your heart with all diligence for, from it flow the springs of life. Don't seek to move on to some new thing again and again, but seek to allow the Lord to establish you in the things that he's already given you. And that requires keeping, keep them in the midst of your heart. It requires watching, watch over your heart. And what the Lord was um, challenging me with is there's a danger when we're focused on simply receiving revelation like a collector. When we have this aficionado's attitude, I just want some new truth. I just love getting new truth. And he showed me the danger you remember in um, Matthew's gospel, there's a time where um, Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, right? And, and Jesus says, you're blessed, Simon, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father revealed it. He's in heaven and he revealed that to you. And in a different conversation, the Lord Jesus says something very different to Peter. Do you know what he says to Peter? He doesn't say, you are blessed, Peter. You know what he says? Get behind me, Satan. Here's a question, pop quiz, if anybody knows. How many books separate are those? Two incidents. None, they're actually in the same book. How many chapters separate are those two statements? None, they're in the same chapter. There's five verse separation from Peter being blessed for having received a revelation to being called Satan. Jesus actually righteously calling him Satan. How is it possible to fall from such a you know, blessed state to such a, not just neutral, but to the pits of hell. He didn't hold on to the revelation he had received. And I, I really believe that if Peter had held on to the truth that Jesus was the Messiah, he wouldn't have been rebuked. He wouldn't have dared say to Jesus, hey, you don't need to go to the cross, because he would have known. But the problem is he didn't hold on to the revelation that he'd received. And because he had forgotten what he had been given, he fell so quickly. And so for me, the encouragement has been, hold on to the Lord's training program. Submit to the lesson plan that the Lord as a gracious, loving Father is enforcing in my life. Fight the lust for some new thing all the time. Fight the lust for novelty and the things of God. And seek instead to submit 
to his instruction and to master the one lesson he has for me today. I want to master that lesson. And maybe it's conquer the one giant he's made me aware of in the promised land. You know, in the, in, 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 when the Israelites entered the promised land, they didn't have to fight all the giants at once. They fought them kind of giant by giant as they entered the land. And for me, what I'm seeing is the Lord say, just focus on this one giant. Eliminate that, and then I'll lead you in to possess more of the promised land. I'll show you. There's definitely more giants out there. Don't worry about all of them right now. There's definitely more that he wants to do, but it starts with sticking to his training program today. And I'll just end with the promise in Proverbs 4. The next verse, it says, Let your eyes look directly ahead. Verse 25. Let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. And this really encouraged me because basically what it says is if you stick fixed on the training program that the Lord has for you today, he'll take care of the rest. He'll make sure that all your ways are established, it says here. If you watch the path of your feet, watch right where the Lord has you. Be diligent to keep your heart with all diligence. Don't let what he's teaching you depart from your sight. And if you do that, he'll take care of all the rest. He'll, all of your ways will be established. This to me is the Old Testament version of seek first the kingdom of heaven and everything else will be added unto you. Seek to attend to the present instruction that the Lord has for you. He'll take care of the rest.